here. All right, Natalie, I had to cut this down significantly for a bio. I hope that I picked highlights uh, in a satisfactory manner. All right, so Natalie has worked on the staffs of the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Philadelphia Daily News, and the Times Picayune. Apologize if I butchered that pronunciation. She worked as a freelance entertainment journalist contributor to the Star Ledger for four years until the COVID-19 pandemic began. She has also written for the Associated Press and the Washington Post and is a frequent contributor to alumni magazines for institutions including Haverford College and the University of Penn. Natalie's strength is documenting the world through the eyes of ordinary people going about their lives or facing extraordinary challenges. She has an eye for the telling detail and an ear for dialogue. She presents her subjects as themselves and not as characters. Natalie is also the co-author of a children's book named Philadelphia A to Z of more Philadelphia murals and the stories they tell. And she's actually here today to speak about her most recent book, This Used to Be Philadelphia, which provides an in-depth look at more than 80 city sites and tells their then and now stories. So Natalie, we have uh, about 30 minutes, 20 for presentation, 10 for Q&A, give or take, it's not hard. Um, but thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you, will you um, keep track of time for me? I will totally lose it. Um, am I gonna get the screen for the show or the slideshow? Would you like to run it or would you like for me to run it for you? Oh, you can run it. Okay, we'll do. I'll just uh, nod appropriately. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay. So anyway, thank you guys for having me. Um, excited to be here. Um, Natalie Pompilio, freelance journalist, live here in the city uh, in Queen Village. I apologize for my background. My husband and I are moving out tomorrow because we're having a major renovation repair done in our house. And it's, uh, it's very weird, it's very empty. Um, I live basically at like six and Carpenter. My sister, Tricia, lives at Front and Carpenter. And this is our second collaboration. So next slide. Tricia and I grew up in central Jersey. Um, if you're a turnpike person, that's exit 10 if you're headed north, um, exit 14 if you're coming up, coming heading south. Trisha moved here in 2000 because her husband went to Thomas Jefferson University Medical School. I lived here for a few years in the 90s, and then I came back in 2002, late 2002, to take a job at the Inquirer. Next slide. We've worked together before. In fact, our first cl collaboration was Walking Philadelphia, 30 walking tours exploring art, architecture, history, and little-known gems, published in 2017. And I am currently in the process of updating that book um, because a lot's changed since 2017. The book did well, um, got some great reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. Next slide. Except for one, this is uh, Lucille. We still didn't have a problem with the content, but she did not like the size of the print. And so for that, she pulled down our entire uh, Amazon review. Um, but Lucille, I'm listening. I heard your cries. Um, next slide. You'll see that the print is bigger in this book and darker. So I hope that I've satisfied at least that problem. That's, this used to be Philadelphia on the right. Okay, back to the first book. Next slide. We got a lot of good press and it made us feel good. Um, but we also hope that all publicity is good publicity because we also got this. Next slide. Yeah, so obviously we were not the sisters charged with shoplifting, but it conveniently is set up that way. Um, Trisha and I grew up in different towns in New Jersey, and this appeared in the town newspaper where she grew up. So I, of course, was delighted beyond belief. And when our father saw it, he's like, she's gonna kill you, you're so dead. Um, obviously she did not kill me. Um, 
you know, we, we got through it, um, but we enjoyed working together. And we dedicated our first book to our mom who had died during the writing of it. Uh, next slide. So how did this come about? Uh, March, 2020, the whole, the whole shutdown's happening. I'm seeing my freelance gigs dry up, especially as an entertainment writer. There's no entertainment, no one's going out. So Reedy Press contacted me, they're based in St. Louis, and they asked me if I wanna do a book with them. Next slide. Reedy specializes in these cultural, historic, and local interest books. They have a lot of different um, series. Now, I decided to do it. I picked this one. And you see, our book is now the fourth book in the This Used to Be series. Um, another series, next slide, um, that if you want to read more about Philadelphia, these are all Reedy Press books. The largest collection is fittingly the 100 things to do in insert place name before you die. So how did we choose the locations that in this used to be Philadelphia? Next slide. Well, we focused on places we were familiar with, ones we'd walked by and wondered about. We were limited to 85 places. So we had to leave a lot of places out. And now as I'm redoing the Walking Philadelphia book, I keep finding more places that I wish I'd included, but I would need to have double the size of the book because there's so much interesting stuff going on. But if I get to do a second edition of This Used to be Philadelphia, one of the places I want to include is the 23rd Street Armory. Next slide. So, you know, this casual castle, uh, we all know it, or maybe we don't. It's, I like to think of it as near the Trader Joe's. Um, uh, to this day, it's the official home of the first troop Philadelphia City Cavalry, the oldest continued, continued operated mounted military unit in the country. It was organized in 1774, and it was organized to defend the colonies against the British. Members of the troop served as George Washington's personal bodyguards. The armory was built, this building itself, in 1901 after the roof of the original headquarters collapsed. Next slide. Today, the unit is part of the Pennsylvania National Guard. It is an all-male ground combat unit. When it was founded, the troops members were part of the city's wealthy elite. Today's members share a desire to serve and a respect for history. They donate their National Guard stipends for upkeep of the armory. Next slide. The horses that were once stable here are now in Collegeville, but the building continues to serve as storage and a museum for the first troop. Items here include the original 1774 battle flag, the original uniforms designed by the apparently very multifaceted Marquis de Lafayette, and a photo of first troop member Pete Conrad, the third man to walk on the moon. Next slide. Contemporary Philadelphians probably know this space because of the special events hosted here, including the Philadelphia Furniture Show, um, Punk Rock Flea Market, and it has also hosted youth basketball program summer camps. So the next historic building that I wish I'd included also as a military tie, if, next slide. This is the former 32nd Street Armory in West Philadelphia on the campus of Drexel. This massive trapezoidal structure was built in 1916 for National Guard training. Then when Senator Arlen Specter died in 2012, his family spearheaded a $27 million transformation project to make this the first national center for the squash playing community. It is scheduled and I think it's still happening, to host the 2021 U.S. Open Squash Championships. It's one thing I want to add is that writing books like this 
and if you like research or I'm, I'm not a historian, I just like knowing things, you just fall into these holes of reading. So like I said, what? Arlen Specter was a big squash fan? Oh, let me look that up for no reason other than to use up time that I should be doing something productive. Um, I found this New Yorker article from 2006. And this, let me tell you about Specter on the court. He, quote, still bears the scars of his years as a bruiser on the squash court. Senator Robert Packwood once gave him a swat that took six stitches to close. He plays the same old school hardball version of the game as the Capitol's other celebrated septuagenarian squash enthusiast, Donald Rumsfeld. But the two men have never met on the court. Then of course I had to look into, uh, didn't Packwood come to a bad end and then that, it was, it was a long detour, but back to the book. Uh, next slide. Because I took on this project when everything was shut down and I had to turn in the draft six months later, it was challenging because the libraries were closed, the museums were closed, reference desks were closed. But here's why I got lucky. One. I already had a ton of information I couldn't use in Walking Philadelphia. And two, because I did Walking Philadelphia, I have so many Philly-centric books. Three, there are so many fabulous websites dedicated to Philadelphia, the few listed here. And four, I could read, thanks to the world being so digitalized, you can find National Register of Historic Places, original applications scanned in online, online. And it, it's great, it's, it's so interesting. I also relied heavily on newspapers, newspapers.com because that's my happy newspaper place. Next slide. But even with these limited resources, as I noted with Arlen Specter, you can fall into the rabbit holes about reading everything and then you use like a single sentence. That said, next slide. When I was putting this presentation together, I somehow ended up on a site for MIT researchers who were translating the structure of a spider's web into music and finding ways that we could communicate with spiders. Um, and for some reason, this just freaked me out so much. Um, it made for a, a very interesting few days, but which is why we're seeing Charlotte here. All right, let's talk to the about the book. Next slide. Welcome to North Philadelphia. This is the former home of actor Edwin Forrest, who was involved in one of the most supreme cases of fan obsession I've ever seen. Next slide. Forrest made his stage debut in 1820 at age 14 at the city's Walnut Street Theater. Some say he was the native country's first native born son, the Brad Pitt of his times, the first native born star. This, despite the fact that some people who have seen his statue at Walnut Street Theater, next slide, have mistakenly thought it depicts Nick Offerman, AKA Ron Swanson of Parks and Recreation. And there is a long Reddit thread um, devoted to this controversy, but apparently that is really forced in his later years. Now we say he's the first American born star because previous to that, the Brits dominated the American stage. One big star, Next slide, William McCready. Both of these men considered themselves the world's premier interpreters of Shakespeare. McCready's American fans were generally wealthy Anglophiles. Forrest was popular with new immigrants and the working class. Um, next picture, next slide. Uh, 1849, McCready was performing Macbeth's at New York's Astor Place Opera House. Coincidentally, but definitely not coincidentally, 
Forrest was doing the same show at another theater a few blocks away. Next slide. Forrest fans went to one of McCready's shows and did what one does when they don't like an actor. They threw rotten eggs, potatoes, lemons, apples, shoes, whatever they could at the stage. They also yelled things like, quote, take down the codfish aristocracy, unquote, which I'm sure was a really sick burn in the 1840s. A few days later, this is a depiction of what happened. More than 10,000 people, fans of both actors, gathered outside the opera house while McCready was on stage. Of course, they started fighting. Uh, next slide. City officials called in the local militia who for some reason opened fire, killing some people in the crowd at point blank range. When it was over, at least 22 people were dead and dozens more injured. Almost all of those who died were forest fans. Next slide. There are stories of women walking around the streets near the theater the next day where the bodies had been lined up looking for their loved ones. So Astor Place Opera House stumbled along for another year, but next slide, they couldn't shake the name Massacre Opera House or Disaster Place and it was shuttered. From what I found, McCready left the US after that and never performed here again. He took his final bow in London in 1851. Forrest, however, was still beloved. He purchased the home that's in the book on North Broad Street in 1872. He, oh, sorry, he, he lived there until his death in 1872. So he lived there about 20 plus years. 1880 to 1960, the building was the home of the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, um, which in the early part of the 1900s was the largest art school for women in the US. It is now part of Moore College of Art. In 1968, Forest Home became the Freedom Theater, a performance venue that all, also offered theatrical training to young black actors. Next slide. The company has been called New Freedom Theater since the 1990s. Next slide. Among the school's many alums is, next slide, Leslie Odom Jr., the East Oak Lane kid who the world knows as the original Aaron Burr sir in the musical Hamilton. As an unrelated side note, I had the pleasure of interviewing him and it was my niece's birthday the next day and she was huge in the Hamilton. And so I had my tape recorder on. I'm like, could you wish my niece a happy birthday? And he's like, she, is she there? And I said, no, no, I'll tape it. So he was fabulous. He said, happy birthday, Madeline Paxson, 12 years old. I mean, nine years old, you're almost double digits. Good job. This was the best gift Madeline has ever gotten. And every year on her birthday, she still plays it. So I'm very thankful to Leslie Odom Jr. Uh, next slide. In 1927, the Schubert family honored Edwin Forrest by naming their new theater after him. All right, now we're gonna jump to West Philadelphia. Next slide. So this is Clark Park. And that's the Dickens statue there with little Nell next to him. This was established, the park was established in 1895 at the community hub. Uh, next slide. And if you're familiar with West Philadelphia today, it is, it remains that. It's where you go for, um, for flea markets, for performances, for the farmer's market. I walked through there last weekend. It's just, it's a very well-loved space. What, what you may not know, next slide, is that during the Civil War, this land was occupied by the Union Army's largest hospital. Next slide. In 
originally called West Philadelphia General Hospital, tens of thousands of soldiers from both sides of the conflict were treated at Satterley between 1862 and 1865. It's unclear what the exact number of treated patients was, with some publications saying 10,000 and others saying 50,000, but we know it gave excellent care. Why put the hospital in Philadelphia? Well, then as now, it was a, the, the city was a medical hub. Um, we had the first hospital, the first medical school, the first pharmacy. Even today, it's estimated that one out of six practicing physicians did some training in Philadelphia. Next slide. Putting the hospital in West Philly made sense too. It was a rural area and army officials hoped that the fresh country air would speed soldiers recoveries. The nearby Schuylkill River provided not only a water source, but also a transportation outlet. Steamboats carrying wounded soldiers would dock at 42nd Street and the injured would continue to Satterley via a creek raft, horse-drawn carriage or cart. Next slide. The hospital had beds for 4,500 patients in either its main building or one of the hundreds of tents that surrounded it. It was a city into itself. It had its own barber shop. It had its own newspaper. It had its own post office, its own library. At its peak, the population of Satterley annually consumed 800,000 pounds of bread, 1,600 pounds of butter, and 334,000 gallons of milk. Next slide. Dr. Isaac Israel Hayes, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, commanded the, the whole facility. One of his rules, every case involving the possible removal of a limb had to be reported directly to him. He would then consult with, quote, not less than three surgeons, unquote, to determine if the extreme measure was necessary. And I added that because I think many of us think of the Civil War and soldiers coming home missing limbs, which obviously happened, but that was usually um, battlefield medicine. Um, they, they, they tried to save them if they could. Next slide. Hayes and the other doctors were supported by um, nuns belonging to the Daughters of Charity Order. And like I said, the care was exceptional. Most sources consistently report that of all the patients that went through the hospital, only 300 died from battle wounds. One patient later wrote that the nuns, quote, are different from anyone else or from other people for they never get sick and they do for us what no other person would do. They are not afraid of the fever, smallpox or something else. Next slide. And perhaps the most beloved um, was Sister Mary Gonzaga Grace. She was the supervisor of the nuns and years after the war, veterans remembered her as a ministering angel, noting no matter what the creed, her devotion was ever the same. She was one of the purest and loveliest of women. When she died in 1898, age 85, Rhode Island Congressman Ambrose Kennedy read the following into the congressional record. In her demise, there passed out of this life a woman of boundless charity, whose ministrations among thousands of Union and Confederates contributed a note of beauty to the many harassing details of the war. Next slide. The hospital's patient population rose by the hundreds after the Second Battle of Bull Run and by the thousands after the Battle of Gettysburg. That may be why community members in 1915 chose to memorialize the hospital with a stone from Devil's Den in Gettysburg. If you wanna find it, it's on the south side of Baltimore Avenue between 43rd and 44th, but there's a lot of uh, green in the way. Uh, next slide. This stone and a historic marker on nearby Baltimore Avenue 
are the only signs that the hospital once stood here. And I, you'll see the inscription um, that's on that stone, but it's a little, it can be challenging to read. Next slide. Now we're coming to my neighborhood um, and we're gonna talk about Moya Mensing Prison. Never heard of it? Well, that's because today I call it, next slide, the Acme that I shop at at 10th and Reed. Um, it blew my mind to think <laughs> that this used to be a prison. Next slide. The name Moya Mensing comes from the native Lenny Lenape word that's been translated to, quote, place of pigeon droppings or place of judgment. I don't know how those two things go together. But this prison was alternately known as the 11th Street Dock, the Jug, and the County Hotel. When it opened in 1835, some observers said it looked like a Gothic castle. One historian wrote, it looked like it had been built for the ages. The ages came to an end in 1963. Next slide. Moya Mensing had 490 cells in the main building, each about 13 by nine with nine foot ceilings. This, but despite its intimidating exterior, escapes seem to happen relatively often. Next slide. A 1959 Philadelphia Inquirer article tallied 15 escapes in 25 years, which I'm not an expert on prison escapes, but it seems like a lot. That same year, three inmates busted a hole in their cell ceiling, then used a bed sheet rope to repel the prison's 40 foot wall. The men left a message behind on the wall. It said, the food isn't fit for pigs. Also, inmates are locked in their dungeons for 21 hours a day. We all hope you tear this joint down tomorrow, then maybe we'll come back. Obviously they were recaptured. It's unclear if their food was ever improved. Next slide. Now, most of Moya Mensing's inmates were short timers. Among them, Edgar Allan Poe and Al Capone. Poe slept off a drunken bender here in 1849. Capone was here overnight in 1929 after being arrested outside a city movie theater for carrying a concealed, unlicensed 38 caliber revolver. After that one night, he was transferred to Eastern State Penitentiary. Next slide. Another notable in, inmate was lawyer and abolitionist Passmore Williamson. He spent about 100 days behind bars for his role in helping free and then hide enslaved woman Jane Johnson and her two sons. Um, I'm gonna detour a bit to talk about this incident because it was a big deal. It happened in 1855 and drew lots of national attention, further increasing tensions between the North and South as we move toward civil war. Next, next slide. <clears throat> so it's 1855, slavery is illegal in Pennsylvania. But a politician from North Carolina named John Wheeler still came through the city on his way to travel by steamboat to New York and then overseas to be a US ambassador. He was bringing with him three individuals he considered his property, Jane and her two sons. David was six, Isaiah was 10. Next slide. Wheeler and his entourage get to Philadelphia that July. Wheeler goes out to dinner and as the story goes, Jane took that chance to tell a restaurant worker that she and her children were slaves and she did not want to go with Wheeler. That message reached William Still, Pennsylvania, a black man born to free parents in New Jersey. He was a member of the Anti-Slavery Society and often led teams that helped those seeking freedom. Still 
calls his friend Williamson, a lawyer, and the only white member of his team. And both went to the waterfront knowing the boat carrying John Johnson was scheduled to leave in 30 minutes. Next slide. They, gentlemen, with the support of some black dock workers, start confronting Wheeler and talking to Jane Johnson. Onlookers, meanwhile, were shouting that these, this group to just go away and leave this person, leave, leave Wheeler alone and don't try to rob a man of his property. But Williamson persisted. He, he asked Johnson if she wanted to be free. She said yes, and she took his hand. That's when the fight broke out. Um, and in the melee, two of the dock workers grabbed the kids and ran off the ship. Williamson and Johnson followed with Wheeler in pursuit. They jumped, they jumped into a carriage, everyone left, and the police refused to help Wheeler with one cop saying, I'm not a slave catcher. Next slide. But Williamson, I mean, was known to people and he was arrested for his role in this. Uh, the pro-slavery judge he went in front of demanded that he tell where Jane Johnson and her sons were. He would not and were thus jailed for contempt of court. Uh, next slide. Wheeler said Williamson was the only person involved in the incident who deserved punishment because of all the parties in the act of violence. He was the only white man, the only citizen, the only individual having recognized political rights, the only persons whose social training could certainly interpret either his own duties or the rights of others under the constitution of the land. So like I said, this incarceration made headlines across the country. Uh, but don't, don't worry, because Williamson's stint behind bars was as pleasant as could be. I mean, he had more than 500 visitors, including Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Next slide. He was able to furnish his cell most comfortably. Lucretia Mott would comment that Williamson's imprisonment was extremely helpful to the abolitionist movement. In fact, she said, Williamson's father's only concern was that he would get out of prison too soon. Next slide. Williamson was released from prison in November. One newspaper said he left with a triumph and a fame which but few men in the great mad battle for freedom could claim. Now, before you want, want to make it clear that Jane Johnson took an active role in her own escape and risked her own freedom to fight for Williamson. Next slide. When I should give you a heads up on the time because I promised that I would. We're at oh, yeah. uh, twelve fifty-five, so we're probably at the probably around the thirty-five minute mark. So if we want to wrap up, we can soon. We can leave time for some Q and A. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll just we'll just go through a. Uh, up to slide uh, 69. Or just tell me when. I can't see the, uh, the actual <laughs> okay. number. But still, we got to let's go back to where we were, though. There you go. Okay. So now go there. Future slave bill. Um, there was a warrant out for her arrest, a federal warrant under the Fugitive Slave Act. Despite that, Jane Johnson returned to Philadelphia to testify in court that it was her choice to leave Wheeler. She was not kidnapped. She said, nobody forced me away. Nobody pulled me away. Nobody led me. I went away of my own free will. I would rather die than go back. Next slide. When Johnson left court that day, no one was sure if the US Marshal who was there with a posse of officers would attempt to arrest her. Preparing for that, city police officers lined the path between the courthouse and the carriage she would leave in. 
the marshals and his men did not move. Jane and her family settled in Boston and her son Isaiah served in the US colored troops during the Civil War. Next slide. A historic marker near the Delaware River at Walnut Street tells part of this story. Um, if you remember, we were actually talking about Moya Mensing Prison, and then I had a 10 slide detour. But back to Moya Mensing. Uh, next slide. Uh, when I referred to research rabbit holes, I could talk for an hour about William Still alone. Um, how do you pick and choose whose stories to tell and what to say? I don't know. It's, it's a fascinating question. Next slide. Not all of Moya Mensing's um, inmates were as noble as Passmore Williamson. One of the most notorious was H.H. H. Holmes, America's first serial killer. Um, if you read Eric Larson's 2003 book, Devil in the White City, you're familiar with this man and his story. He took advantage of the 1893 Chicago World Fair to kill an unknown amount of people. Next slide. Um, he would uh, he advertised rooms in a hotel as his World's Fair hotel, and he had it specially designed. So once you checked in, you could not check out, and that's not a Roach Motel joke. Um, Next slide. People, it came to be known as the murder castle. The hotel was a maze of his own design with dead ends and confusing hallways. He even killed the builders who worked on it so they could not reveal his secrets. He wanted this so he could torture and kill at his own pace. Next slide. Holmes's victims included men, women, and children, and he used multiple methods to kill. Starving some, suffocating others, giving others an overdose of chloroform. He was arrested in Philadelphia in 1894 and sent to Moya Mensing. Next slide. Before his execution by hanging in 1896, he released a confession that was published in the Inquirer. He called himself a degenerate and admitted to killing 27 people. Some historians believe his victims may number in the hundreds. Next slide. That said, although Holmes said this one day, the next day he died protesting his innocence as these headlines attest. Um, I'm not sure how those things go together, but I do know as someone who shopped at that Acme, I'm constantly wondering where the gallows was. Next slide. Acme, the prison closed in 1967. Acme moved in uh, 10 years later. But I want to present this final example of how everything's connected. Because when I was putting this, this presentation together, I found articles about a 2018 Brit, uh, Channel 4 BBC show called Meet the Markles. In it, uh, H. H. Holmes's great great grandson said, "Markle, Meghan Markle, is a distant relative of his, and therefore America's first serial killer." That said, spokesman for the show promised it was quote humorous and warm in tone. The moral of the story, at least for me, is do not play with the British tabloids; they are serious. And that's uh, that's where we are. We're, there's more, but you can read them in the book. Thanks, Natalie. All right, guys, and we can open it up. I know we're uh, at one o'clock. We'll open it up for, for Q&A for a few minutes and then take it from there. I, I just want to say this was a very interesting presentation yeah. and you know time went so fast I truly wish that you could come back and you know delight us with more stories I will for once buy all of your books I love them you know this is very well and I even though you say you're not a historian it really truly seemed like that very interesting and 
wishing you would come back and visit us. Well, I'll talk to Alex. We'll do, we'll do the second Sounds half. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, the, the new guy has a question. Absolutely fascinating conversation. Thank you. Did you come across information on Holmes that he might have been actually tied to Jack the Ripper as well? I, I have something in the back of my mind tells me about that. Yeah, there's some scholarship that people are trying to say like those two overlapped or maybe they're even the same person, but you know, nothing. We, everyone's trying to find Jack the Ripper even today. So yeah, blame it on him. We know he killed at least 27 people. This is true. Thank you. Thank you again for the time. It was really interesting. Thanks. All right, guys, well, any other questions? Anyone wants to email me, I can sell you a book at a $2 discount. Don't let Jeff Bezos rule us. Oh, too late, because I just bought the book. I'll have it in my hands, so uh, I guess uh, it's this Sunday by 8 p.m. But uh, yeah, ex excellent talk and like the historical aspects. And, you know, I know I'll be walking a lot starting uh, maybe this weekend in, in Philadelphia. Thank you so much. Oh, I want to say this, uh, this used to be Philadelphia is getting a second print run. The first print run for reasons unknown, they did not put the exact addresses in, which made people very angry because when you describe a place, you want to go see it. The second print run, which they're doing, will have the exact addresses. Well, that's all I got, guys. Thanks for listening. <laughs>